All right, guys, welcome. This is basic first aid. It goes in with that first video, which was the CPR and the AED. Keep in mind, there's many different levels of CPR, but again, this is strictly the basic. And when we look at the first aid, there's a couple of areas that I wanna make sure we focus on, but keep in mind that all of this is done with your class, right? So we're gonna look through a lot of this basic information, but there's skill times that will take to go through things such as the epinephrine injector and Narcan as well as tourniquets, but there's no reason why we can't do the didactic this way. So we can of course spend much less time in person with you, but still have some vital things we need to make sure that we check off. So here we go. The first aid itself is broken up into three individual categories. There's medical emergencies, there's injury emergencies, and then we have environmental emergencies. So we'll kind of make our way through each of these and make sure, especially when we get to your class, that if you have any questions, again, you can either drop them in the comments section or you can make sure you write them down, bring those notes to class. And again, the goal is that by the time we're done, everybody is 100% confident with this material because that's truly what this is all about. I will give you a hint that there may be certain test questions that come up. So as I go through these parts and think, hey, this would be a great opportunity for a test question, I will probably even tell you that. So keep that in mind. But moving on with medical emergencies, first thing we're gonna look at is asthma. And what's outlined here is you can see the normal lung. You can see a lung that's affected with asthma and the buildup of this mucus. And then when that person is really having an asthma attack, it's become really hard to breathe. So again, just recognize when we look at the pathophysiology of asthma, why this is so important. Well, imagine you, you typically drink through something that's that big and you're taking in that air. Now they've only got a fraction of that. So asthma is a, a true emergency. One of the treatments we're gonna look for is their inhaler. And as I put on here, well, wheezing, difficulty breathing, HX stands for history of. So if someone has a history of asthma, they're likely to have an inhaler. So of course, there's little notes I've jotted down here at the bottom. Assist patient with the inhaler. If no changes or that person gets worse, then it's time to call 911, right? No strenuous activity. Don't have them walk from point A to point B. Just sit them down, keep them calm. And remember with all this, it's important to keep yourself calm as well because that's something that the patient can react to. But again, if you've never seen an inhaler, we'll have plenty of those available just to make sure that you understand your roles and responsibilities at, as that potential first aid provider. Next thing I want to look at was anaphylaxis. And anaphylaxis, when you look at the swelling of the tongue or lips, difficulty breathing, but this is something that's going to be brought about by an exposure. And I put some examples down here as well. Bee stings can do it peanut allergies, latex, there's any number of things that people can be anaphylactic to. Anaphylaxis is different from a normal uh, allergic reaction, right? A normal allergic reaction may include hives or someone who is actually just itching. Okay, but what separates the typical allergic reaction from anaphylaxis is there's airway involvement. Okay, the, the bronchioles are starting to narrow, similar to what we saw in asthma. But again, there was some trigger for that. So we use the epinephrine pen. These come in two forms. There's adult as well as the pediatric. An adult pen, it's a good thing for a question, is 0.3 milligrams. And a pediatric pen is actually 0.15. So it's simply half of that dose. The best place to position this epinephrine pen is actually on the lateral aspect of the thigh. This is an intramuscular injection, so we wanna make sure there's a large muscle that that needle can go into, and it can actually perfuse into their system. The, here's, a, here's an even better test question, and I'll go with this one. You need to leave that pen in place, at least the ones that we're looking at here, for 10 seconds. Because if you were to pull that pen away too quickly, what would happen is the needle would retract and that medication wouldn't get into the patient. So as we take that blue cap off, we press it up against the outer portion of the thigh or the lateral aspect of the thigh for a minimum of 10 seconds. Again, and that's why I wanted to put this on here as well, 
that is a skill. We'll practice that in class just to make sure that everybody's comfortable with it. The next thing I have down is diabetes. And diabetes, again, there's a couple of different types. One is the high blood sugar or hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia. The other one that we're concerned with now is hypoglycemia. So they're not getting enough sugar. Pay attention to the notes that we have down here on the left-hand side, that confused or combative behavior. Maybe they're sleepy or disoriented. And again, as long as they're still in that phase, then we can certainly give them some sugar. And, and right, I wasn't gonna choose between Coke or Pepsi. That sounds like a Super Bowl ad. I just wanted to know that we don't wanna give them a diet drink because that contains no sugar. You wanna be careful that if they do, if the patient can swallow, we definitely wanna give that sugar. But if they can't and they start to lose consciousness, make sure we're not putting anything in their mouth and call 911. Right? If you had candy or food that was in their mouth, you want to actually turn them to the side and try and take that out. It's just a process called aspiration, where if they're not able to swallow, they may actually suck that down into their airway. But giving someone that immediate rush or what we call a bolus of sugar is often enough of a treatment that they can start getting their balance back. Then you should follow that uh, sugar up with some complex carbohydrate, some protein, it's more of a sustainable sugar for them. But uh, that is our concern, it's hypoglycemia with a diabetic patient. Stroke is next. And stroke also recognizes what's called the fast mnemonic. So if you see a patient presenting with a facial droop, so one side it's just, it's not symmetrical to the other, you may have them put their arms up and if there's weakness or they're not able to support that, we consider that the A for the arm drift. Speech problems such as slurred speech are certainly possible with a stroke. It's just the way the cranial nerves are affected. Those are the ones that are most commonly affected. And then the T equals time to call 911. What we don't wanna do is give the person anything to eat or drink at this point just kind of stay by their side, keep them comfortable, keep them safe until help arrives. But your best form of treatment for someone that's experiencing those stroke-like symptoms is merely rapid calling of 911. They need to get to a hospital, they need to CT scan, find out if this is a brain bleed versus some type of blockage where they're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. So just with stroke, make sure you remember the fast mnemonic, facial droop, arm drift, speech problems, equal time to call 911. On chest pain, and put this up here as well, it's just some narrow portion of the heart itself. It could be the left anterior descending, the right anterior descending, or the circumflex. Those are just little vessels in the heart that actually feed it. And when those become blocked, why does it become blocked? It can be because of arterial or atherosclerosis. That's just a hardening or the narrowing of the arteries. We see how the patient may actually present pain in the chest or the back. Should also include the shoulder blades are certainly possible to, for someone to be experiencing pain there. Sweating, nausea. This is all the body's reaction to that lack of oxygen that the heart muscle is actually getting. If there is a history of cardiac issues. Yeah, and that's another thing. Hey, I had a heart attack a couple of years ago. Pain is very reminiscent. So again, they may feel just like they did back then. We want to sit the person, keep sit the person down, keep them calm, avoiding having them do anything strenuous at this point. There is a protocol where you can actually give baby aspirin. Again, 81 milligram uh, is a baby aspirin tablet. They could chew two to four of those. I put on here, call 911 and follow instructions per their dispatch. Because again, different parts of the city have different recommendations that they're going to give you. So just keep that in mind. But if you see chest pain or heart attack, there's a saying that goes, time is tissue. And it's just like with a stroke where that time is tissue in the brain. Same thing goes with the chest pain or the heart attack, right? We don't know exactly what this is until, you know, as a paramedic may show up, put this person on a monitor and we can see this blockage, but we don't want to delay that transport. Okay? The sooner they get you know, 911 there and that response can be started, the better off that patient is going to be. Overdose, there 
is a medication called Narcan, AKA Naloxone, that works to reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. There's a plunger, which I will be pointing at here, which actually goes up into their nose. And as you spray that, it actually atomizes into a mist as it targets the nares, and that's a, a safe way to give naloxone. Some of the things that you're looking for as far as how do I know if someone's overdosed? slow or shallow respirations. I also put the evidences at scene, so you may have obvious evidence of drug use or you happen to know this person is an opioid user, right? Maybe it's a patient that comes in and you happen to know a little bit about their history and you see them acting, you know, they seem tired, they're not breathing, you know, as deep and regular as they should be, that would certainly be okay to administer Narcan if your policy permits, right? Good Samaritan law says, yes, absolutely. You should go ahead and give Narcan for that patient. But if your work says otherwise, that's just something you need to be aware of, right? I'm not here to tell you, hey, we're changing this policy or that policy. We just want you to know what the Good Samaritan law and the, the crux of this program is, and that says Narcan is safe to use. Narcan is safe to use because it only responds to someone who has opioids on board. Right? You have certain receptors that are targeted in your brain, and when opioids are introduced into the system, you can actually slow that breathing down. Well, what Narcan does, since it is a specific to those receptors, is it can actually push that drug off, in this case the opioid, and it allow them to start breathing on their own again. But I always have to say, call 911. If you're going to administer Narcan, and even if that person starts returning to normal breathing and, and mental status, as quickly as they went in to that overdose state, they can actually return to that once the Narcan wears off. This is a nasal route. There are different routes that are given intramuscularly or through an IV, which are a little stronger and they last longer. But for this type of Narcan, we can't guarantee how long it's going to last. If you give one dose and that's not sufficient and you happen to have another, it would certainly be okay to give that. What I put on here was, again, good opportunity. Just write down if you have any questions about those first parts with the uh, medical emergencies and things that we're going to practice, right? The epinephrine, the Narcan, just all those skills we want to make sure that you're comfortable and confident with. So the next section is injury emergencies. And injury emergencies from strains and sprains or fractures or someone that, that's bleeding, let's take a look at the first one, which is actually one way to control bleeding, which is defined as blood that's exiting the body. Okay? Well, direct pressure and elevation are always our first term of uh, form of treatment for that. Now, if bleeding is arterial, that means it creates this spurting of blood, right? The arteries in your body are the vessels that are under the highest amount of pressure. And with that, you want to make sure if you have been trained, of course, and that's something we're going to make sure you do, is utilize a tourniquet. The tourniquet is placed approximately two inches above the injury site. It's got the bar here that we actually crank down on. But notice there's a time window because What's referred to as skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle can actually survive for about three to four hours without receiving oxygen. When you think of the concept of a tourniquet, the tourniquet is designed to stop that blood flow from this portion of the arm on down. So it's really vital that you make sure you log in what time this was placed on. Oftentimes people do not have, and this is actually a CAT, it stands for Combat Action Tourniquet. If you do not have a cat tourniquet available, then just get creative, right? You could use a belt, you could use you know, a lanyard, you could use a lot of things. But the most important thing is that we stop that flow of blood from exiting the patient, because in actuality, it can be as little as a minute that if someone has an arterial bleed, that they could actually bleed out. So again, the goal here, and this comes from a program called Stop the Bleed, is to get those things on as quickly as possible, call 911 and just make sure that you note that time. You definitely have to note the time if you're gonna put a tourniquet on someone. So getting into some of the uh, soft tissue injuries, I actually wanted to do this separately, right? So a joint or a bone, this can 
right now we're just looking at the joint or the muscle, which is referred to as a strain or a sprain, right? We can look at this ankle and we use what's called RICE, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Sounds like a great idea for a test question right there. So if you do notice that on someone, we're gonna elevate that leg, put some ice on it. The compress just means a light wrap that goes around it to keep that in place. You do have to know that ice should not go directly on the skin. Right? We should have a barrier that's in between that, maybe a towel or something that's actually gonna keep that on, and that would be your compression. And then elevation. So what's different from that is an actual fracture, right? A fracture is where the bone ends have actually separated. And what I meant by keep patient still, control bleeding with minimal pressure, is if that, that is an open fracture, right? You can have open fractures and you can have closed fractures. Closed fractures certainly present with what's referred to as deformity. So you look at the arm and it looks like an S, that's a fracture. But there's often times where that bone will actually break out of the skin. And so you don't obviously want to put a lot of pressure on that to try to control the bleeding. The truth is, once those vessels hit the air, there, there should be a lot of vasoconstriction that's taking place. But I would always recommend it's a moist dressing that you place across that open bone fragment. Just because if bones dry out, they lose their ability to, you know, replenish themselves. And if that bone actually dies, we can have some really severe issues for that. Again, call 911. That I have to stretch it. Not only calling 911, but we have to recognize scene safety. And as we move through, I know when we get to the burns, that's something that we might think more about if someone's still on fire or automobile accident. If it's not safe to get to the scene, then maybe you're just calling 911, right? So your safety has to come first. For head and neck injuries, and a patient could be presenting with some form of paralysis. It doesn't have to be paralysis. It could be numbness or tingling, pain in the neck, the back, any type of traumatic injury. We have a suspicion that the head and the neck could be involved. Your head, neck, and spine uh, control your phrenic nerves, which are responsible for your breathing. So if you had someone who you know, fell and hit their head or it was an automobile, automobile accident or even fell off a ladder and they jarred their neck, we just try and keep that person calm and still, right? Just like this as they're laying down. We're still communicating. We're still talking. But I'm just telling them, hey, I don't want you to move your neck. We're going to get you checked out because there's much deeper assessments that are going to go on. We're going to check neurovascular status, check the motor and sensory nerves. But if you can just remember to keep that person calm and still until help arrives, then you've done a tremendous job. That's why I say try not to move the patient and call 911. For burns, again, redness, pain, could be burnt clothing that shows up. In a situation such as we're looking at this slide here, I uh, gotta decide that scene's probably not safe to enter. So again, if you saw something like that, what do we do? Well, we call 911 and we stand by. For specific burn treatments, we need to be concerned with that cool water, right? Stop the burning process for someone. This is primarily with thermal burns, but if there happened to be a chemical that was on the patient, we wanna make sure we brush that off the skin first before we would irrigate that area with water. If there's things that get in the eyes, it's always recommended that you irrigate those for at least 15 minutes, just to make sure there's no burning that's still gonna happen after the person stops that water from going in their eyes. If, I'll just say it, no home remedies, no peanut butter, no mayonnaise, no butter. There's, you know, I always get, oh, what about this or that? And of course, that is something that's cool, that's going on that burnt skin, but what it does is it ends up trapping the heat in eventually and makes that area worse. And then it can lead to infection and infection leads to sepsis. So if you are going to apply an ointment, FDA approved ointments only, some type of you know spray that says for burn treatment specifically. That would be appropriate. But honestly, if you just keep cooling that area, running it underwater until 
help shows up. There are some critical areas that we should be concerned with. The hands, the face, because they could have sucked in this superheated gases and it can actually burn the lining of their airway, the feet, and the groin. So those are all critical areas of function for someone. So we'll also look at in class, I wanna make sure we cover the electrocutions, right? Keep in mind that if someone's still in contact with that wire, whatever it is that they were touching that you know shocked them or electrocuted them, there is a great opportunity for that to actually be transferred to you. So we don't wanna to touch them. We wanna just call 911. If you can ensure that the power is shut down, then it would be safe to approach that patient. This kind of takes us back to the CPR part where you may find that person, hey, they're not breathing. And if they're not breathing, you wanna start CPR and get an AED on them as soon as possible because that electrical intervention can lead to cardiac arrest. And, but if you have an AED or if you've at least called 911 and started compressions, then you truly are doing the best thing that you can at that point. Uh, next section, last section is actually environmental. And environmental, we'll go over things as heat, cold related emergencies, you know, envenomation. There's a whole lot of things that can actually happen through our environment. And that'll actually be the first one, is the heat related emergency. And on the next slide, I have this set up so you can differentiate between the heat exhaustion and the heat stroke, right? Because those are two different things and each one is gonna be treated differently. So on here, and I just kind of lean forward so you can see that, is the excessive sweating with heat exhaustion, right? Someone's hot, but they're sweating. Sweating is actually a good sign. We look down the cool, pale, clammy skin, okay, nausea and vomiting, rapid, weak pulse, and they're likely having muscle cramps, muscle cramps in the abdominal region or even in the uh, large muscles of the legs. That's heat exhaustion. And with heat exhaustion, we want to move that person into a cooler environment. We want to give them fluids. If you gave them some electrolytes on top of some water, that's great. That might help the, the muscle cramping that they're experiencing. But heat stroke, totally different beast, okay? With the heat stroke, you notice that the, that heartbeat is, is just pounding. It's pounding so fast. It's just trying to cool itself down. We see the sweating stops, right? So if you see someone that's sweating, I can think heat exposure, heat exhaustion, but if they've exhausted all of their compensatory mechanisms, sweating is going to stop. That is a life or death situation, okay? We want to make sure that, well, as we go through, they, they can lose consciousness, they can be disoriented, but here, call 911 immediately. If you have ice packs, those are best when they're placed underneath the armpit or even in the groin. There's large blood vessels that run through the arm, in this case, your brachial artery, and as you're putting something cool down there, it's just that heat of conduction, right? If I cool the body, eventually the blood that's flowing through there can work to decrease that core body temperature. So always you want to make sure you're, you know, right, drinking water, taking a break. If you do work outside, it's, I think it's 104 right now and it's after five o'clock. So again, we got to be mindful of those temperatures. Keep an eye on yourself as well as anyone else that you may be uh, in contact with or working together. So we don't often think of this with the winter weather and being prepared for it, but it does happen here. And again, it's just something to be aware of that when those temperatures start to drop and we get below freezing, it, best treatment for that person who's outside in their cold is to change the environment, right? To put them into some place warm. If their clothing happens to be wet, we wanna remove that and try and put something warmer on them things to stay away from. Sounds like a test question. In cold related emergencies would be caffeine and not allowing the person to smoke. Smoking causes various forms of vasoconstriction throughout your body. And where that person is most susceptible at this point, it's in the fingers, it's in the toes, typically the ears and the nose. And when you smoke, it will actually decrease the amount of blood that's getting down to those areas. So we don't want the person to smoke. We don't want them to drink caffeine. The same thing goes with the vasoconstriction, but call 911. If that 
simple treatment of warming them up has not benefited them whatsoever. And I even put down there if they're you know frozen, and again that can happen depending on the seriousness of your environment or your atmosphere. So that's a call 911 call. But we have to be very careful about trying to move that person, not to gross you out, but we can you know move someone and the finger's frozen. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, you could actually snap that finger off. So be careful and ginger with the patient, if you will. For envenomation, I mean, we have a, a look here at some of the snakes and as well as the scorpions. You know, when we deal with rattlesnakes or pit vipers, they do give you this nice warning system that, hey, stay away, stay away. But if you do have someone that was bit by a snake, we want to stress, there is never a time where it is appropriate to cut that area and try and suck the venom out. Okay, that sounds like another great test question. You just don't do it. So cleaning the area with soap and water, if there is venom that's been put into that person, you will generally see this ecchymosis and swelling. That just means it's gonna bruise and it's gonna swell up almost immediately. Taking the jewelry off, watches, anything that they have on, is again, this can swell quickly and it's so much better than having to cut that watch or cut their jewelry off, right? We are always worried about trying to preserve someone's you know, personal property. So again, that's why if you can take that off, give it to them, give it to a loved one, whatever you do, just make sure you keep that stuff safe, but get it off the person. Scorpions, and with scorpions, they can sting multiple times. The scorpions tend to give you this pain where it's almost like an electrical sensation that goes through them. Again, you can put ice on that, you can cool it down. Snakes, we don't want to put a tourniquet. I do not want to do anything except soap and water, keep it below the level of the heart, and get to an emergency department or call 911. With scorpions, ice is an appropriate treatment. There can be some real negative reactions to, you know, roughly it's a minor percent of the population, but they may actually have some respiratory issues. Again, if anything like that happens after an envenomation, you need to get yourself to the hospital or make sure you're calling 911 for the person. The uh, two that aren't on here are the brown recluse and the black widow. The brown recluse happens to you know, bite you and then it starts developing this necrotic area, which is just a darkening of the tissue, which is actually dying. That needs hospitalization, or at least to have that thing excised out. There's no home remedies for, for envenomation. So again, to the hospital. The Black Widow, it's more common that gives people abdominal crampings and they can have flu-like symptoms. So again, if you're not sure, because sometimes you don't know you were bit or what even bit you, just make sure you follow up with the appropriate level of care for the individual. On poisoning, I always think it's important to list the poison control number and 1-800-222-1222 or 626-6016. That's the local number, but this 800 number, probably a little easier to remember. Please put this in your phone, have that. Uh, Again, sounds like a great test question is to make sure everybody is aware of what the poison control number is. But I also highlighted this here with poison control, do not induce vomiting, right? Depending on what that person has ingested, it could be a caustic solution. So it means it burned on the way down. It could burn twice as bad on the way up after it mixes with the stomach contents. So in very rare, case, very rare occasions, you may be encouraged to induce the vomiting but that's only unless some medical professional instructs you to do so. The bee stings, and I didn't wanna just put this in medical, because although a bee sting can cause an anaphylactic reaction, we just have to be aware that what can you do that's gonna help that person out the most? Well, number one is to keep yourself safe, but bee stings should be scraped out. You should never tweeze a bee stinger. It's hard to see in the uh, picture there, but after they put that in, there's actually a venom sac on the end. And if you were tweezing that out, it can actually inject more venom into the patient. So having the epinephrine available, again, if someone's allergic to bees, they should carry that. 
we just keep an eye on them. If they have that difficulty in the breathing, then you wanna make sure that you administer that epi. And again, call 911, because we're just not sure how long that's going to last. The last slide I have for you here is, that is not everything. Again, the questions, the comments, anything that you have, again, please bring those to class or write them in the comments section. Again, we can just email them back and forth through that just to make sure you get your questions answered. Again, our most important thing is that everybody's comfortable and confident with this stuff before you may actually have to use it. So again, I have to say it was an honor. I appreciate your time and we'll see you soon for the in-person version and give you that test.